Hambini fans and welcome to another episode of Hambini Reams or should I call it Rifts? Something that we don't usually have on the show. Well, a wheel review, but this is a bit different because these are prototypes. So you can't get these yet. Well, you'll probably be able to get them at the time this video is published, but these wheels have been in my possession for quite a period of time. And they were sent in by a Chinese company for two predominant reasons. One is the mechanical bits of it. And two, which is a bit more intriguing, is around the aerodynamics of this. So these have been in the wind tunnel to be tested. And I'll get on to the, the whys and why not of that in a second. What do we got? Well, these are the, the fast sports rims. Um, Normally, I like to have these things for about three months and then continual testing of that over, and that'll be a few thousand kilometers. But I haven't managed to do that on this set because I've been in two places. So the first one, and I think most people know this, is I was in Venlo in the Netherlands for a bit. So it's been on the road around there and it doesn't really get exposed to the same kind of damage that it does on UK roads because Dutch cycle paths are pretty much immaculate and also just over the border into Germany around Cologne. The wheels are shallow by modern standards and you could use these for a multitude of different things, so road use or even gravel. The gravel market has certainly picked up uh, in recent times. Wheels are disc, um, they've got metal spokes, so I think these are Sapim, Sapim. Uh, there's 24 on each wheel, so they're heavily laced. Um, the hubs, and I'll get onto them in a minute, are completely unbranded. Now, if you buy a set of these wheels, it'll have their logo on them, but these ones don't because they are prototypes. It'll become obvious as to why they're prototypes shortly. You can also just probably make out all my grubby, oily prints all over it. Um, in the grand scheme of things, the wheel is held out quite well. Obviously, it's not had the same level of damage that the uh, usual testing procedure goes through, but nonetheless, there's no real issues with that. That's the back wheel, and that is 672 grams. That is the front wheel, and that is 549 grams. Now, some miserable shit in the comments said my tape measure that I used last time was not appropriate. So today, I have brought along my Hultafors Talmater. Now, this is actually this is my work tape measure, so I use this all the time. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with this, there's a couple of things on here which are really useful, and I might as well just go through them at this point. The first is the back has a hook as well as the front, and the other extremely useful thing is you can measure the circumference of things on the back and give you a diameter. So if you want to like get a rough measurement for uh, like, like a wheel, you can run this round it that way because it, it flexes in that direction and then it'll give you the answer. Anyway, back onto the job. The inside of this wheel is around about 24 mil. The outside is about 30. The rim depth is about 30 mil. Just while we're looking at the rim uh, bed, there's no spoke holes in here, and that is a trend that is coming because uh, you don't need to put any rim tape on there. So if you're running tubeless, you can just do that straight away. This is not a hooked rim. Uh, sorry, this is not a hookless rim, so it's got a hook on there and there. So the chance of you losing your wheel in a, uh, losing the tire in a zip moment is fairly limited. You can get these in hookless as well. Um, to be honest, I mean, for just for safety, I'll probably get the hook hooked because uh, it's all I've known. Now, I've only run these with TPU inner tubes from right now. Uh, I've not really had any problems uh, with them at all. The, you know, it's just a fit and forget system, really. Now, normally I start off in the at the outside of the wheel and then tend to work in. But today I'm gonna to do it from the hub outwards. The hub um, is, is really quite well made. I think this has come from 
the same place as uh, the Nine Velo. However, there are some subtle differences, like the ceiling and stuff is different. The other thing I had to do was I had to use one of my metal lock rings. The Shimano one wouldn't quite clear it. Uh, I suspect the production variety, you're not gonna have that issue, but it's just a prototype. So that comes off. It, it is extremely easy to service this thing. Um, so it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a knockoff of the DT, but it uses the same signed, same type of ratchet system. So in order to get that off, you just pull on the end cap and then that exposes the free hub and you can literally just draw that back. Because there's no poles in there, there's nothing to get stuck. So you just draw it back and you just gotta be careful that you don't drop the whole assembly out when you pull it. So I'm gonna get that out like that. And that is it. And then you can just service the whole thing. So on this one, this one doesn't have the, uh, the embedded seal, let's say, um, but it does have the 54 tooth, was it 36 tooth? Not quite sure. Uh, it's plenty, whatever. If you go on a mountain bike, that would make a difference. I uh, didn't really have much to say about this other than the bearings that you can get for these now, 15267 on some of them, that is a non-ISO size. So NTN and SKF and the others didn't used to make that size. So you would be fairly lucky to get it. Um, if you were lucky, you could get NTN. If you weren't so lucky, um, you could end up with Enduro or some Chinese no-name. But one of the Japanese manufacturers, Toyama, um, it's closely affiliated to Nachi and NSK, have started making those sizes, so you can get them now. Um, but again, there's no issues with that. Inside of here is the preload tube. I wouldn't suggest you use the Reginald Scott method of removal. Well, you can if you like, but you'll fuck it up. Um, you just push that down. Oh, Got to get this lined up. And I haven't, so... There we go. Pop that down and then it slides down and then that's it. That's your entire assembly locked up. Uh, and then you pop the cap back on. Now, because this is running steel spokes, so all of these, 24 of them um, on each wheel, you don't generate the same level of tension in here. So when you, you know, apply the tension, it's not expanding that as much. So that's you know, something to consider. Um, so if you do put carbon spokes on there, you will probably fuck the bearing clearance up. So bear that in mind, because I know some people are doing that as an upgrade. So from there onwards, we've got the Sapim spokes, and then they come through down to here, and this is where things get a little bit different. Now on the face of it, it perhaps doesn't look that different to what we've had in the past, but there are some very subtle differences and that is to do with the profile. So previously, Josh Portner, you know, the guy that likes to shill, shilker, shilker, whatever, um, he came up with something called the 105% or was it 105 kilogram rule? And uh, he basically said the rim needs to be uh, a bit wider than the tire. Fastbots have kind of taken that on the head because these wheels are no longer rim brake, so that legacy is gone. So if you look very carefully, this starts to taper at the edge. So at the edge of the hook, it starts to taper down. So the thick bit of the, um, let's call it the aerofoil section, now becomes the tyre, and then it tapers towards there. And that has a fairly... Is it dramatic? Well, it has an effect on aerodynamics, which, I mean, it's, it's debatable whether, you know, the average Joe's going to notice, but, you know, it's there. That also means this wheel rim has a specified tyre. Um, so if you go and, you know, change the tyres to one that's not sort of within the, the recommended type, what will happen is you'll have an aerodynamic deficiency. So. I think they're kind of like aiming these wheels at the kind of people that would have one bike for everything. So a gravel bike with road tires and strong enough wheels. Now the wheels, Fastbot's been making wheels for such a long time. 
you can't really fault them. I mean, I've had fast sports wheels for probably 10 years I've been using them uh, and I've never had an issue. And if you look around the forums, they generally don't tend to have problems. The kind of things they've got on here, so the sapping spokes, that hub is a fairly proven design. You know, I've seen it in other places as well. Um, you're not really gonna have any issues with that. If I just go back to the hub, um, apart from the usual kind of bite marks that you get in there, there's not really anything to write home about that. It's just, just works. It's the same thing on the disc side. They've, they've started going towards hard anodizing now instead of the decorative anodizing. So hard anodizing doesn't come in as many colors. So uh, there's black, I think there's dark gray and a few others. Um, there's sort of psychedelic colors like pink and green. You don't really tend to get that. So this, I mean, you can, you can yeah, it's probably difficult to see on camera, but you can see the marks where the disc's been on and off a few times. This is the front uh, wheel. Again, obviously this is a prototype, so there's no logos on it. Um, unless you knew that it was a, well, where it came from, or if you could read the serial number, because there's a sticker on the wheel somewhere. Um, you wouldn't know where it came from fast sports. This again is dead easy to service. So you've got, just pull the end cap off. Um, there's an O-ring seal in there and then you've got access to the bearings so you can just tap them out. Um, now you can probably fit NTN or Toyama or whatever you want in there. There's not really too much of an issue. Whoever's designed it, well, the chap who's, you know, the hub designer who's designed it has put the bearing clearance in there absolutely spot on for when it's tensioned. So he's, he's thought about it because I've seen plenty of wheel builders who will just build a hub up, not really think too much about opening holes out slightly because they put um, more spokes or more tension on there because the, the thing does flex. You know, there's a tendency for people to reduce weight in these things, make the sidewalls thin, and the net result is when you apply the tension, it, it expands. So you could have the bearing just pop out and that's because there's too much tension in the, uh, in the spokes. Uh, not a lot, lot to say about that. I mean, it just works. Um, yeah. So on a prototype, you often worry about disc brake spacing. Uh, none of that on here is the same as uh, I think every other fast sports wheel I've had. Von 2 is another good wheel. Um, and also some of the, the other the brands from China. There's, there's just nothing to, to say about it. It just fits. The only real damage I had is when I curbed the wheel, so I've had a sideways impact when I came round a Dutch roundabout and then grazed the edge. Didn't fall off, but because this is um, kind of like on the adverse pressure side, so beyond the thick bit of the aerofoil, it does um, mean that you shouldn't get this because the tyre should take the impact because it's wider. So the fact that I got that basically meant the tyre pressure had, or the tyre had flexed far enough for that to touch. Uh, adverse manoeuvre, but there we go. So that's, that's literally all the damage I had. Right then, girls, it is time for that time of the month again. It is oestrogen time. It is time for power point. Uh, there'll probably be a load of people complaining that I said oestrogen in the comments, but there we go. I'm trying to be all inclusive, so even boys have oestrogen. I asked the hairdresser, and she's a doctor. She's also a hairdresser, but anyway. Right, we digress. Oh, fuck's sake, is my pen working? Ah, oh, is the pen is working? Yes, it's pressure sensitive, you see. I've got my new my new craplet and uh yeah it's a uh, very good right fast sports wheels as yet unnamed it might be rd261 but we'll come on to that remember to check me out on fascist book hambini eng on shistagram and uh patriotonion uh, forward slash hambini so on patreon by hambini age five remember to check out the merch in the hambini website right I've pissed around for enough. Who are Fastbots? Well, they are a Chinese OEM of wheels. There is a video that Joe from Panda Podium Cycling, uh, sorry, Panda Podium China Cycling, uh, where you can go and watch. And he goes to interview the, the head lady of the company. It's quite fascinating, actually. You don't usually get 
um, women in high places, certainly in the West. Um, so I found it quite fascinating. So there we go. Right, uh, they're fairly big in the domestic market and they are fairly well known outside of China too. Now, before I go any further, this wheel set, which is the Fast Sports S6 Evo, when I reviewed it, it was called the Von 2. This has been one of those wheel sets which I'd class as a bit of a sleeper. So it came along a bit after the wind space and the wind space took all the headlines uh, at the time. And that was because it was the first. And, you know, there are advantages to being the first, you know, like when you go first. But looking back, and now, you know, a few years have passed, this is probably the best rim brake wheel set that I've ever used. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. First of all, it's lightweight. The aerodynamics are good. Um, it's got very thick bladed spokes compared to the, you know, the contemporaries. And moreover, the braking performance. So it has these little strips uh, like cutouts that look like, you know, Porsche brake discs. When you're riding in the wet and you pull the brakes, the difference between having them and not having them is like day and night. It's to the point even now where, okay, I've got two Skylons, one's a disc and one's a, a rim. I use it to test the wheels um, and some other bikes as well. But anyway, I would probably say the, the rim brake to live with on a daily basis is is easier because you don't have to fuck around with the rim um, brake you know adjustment it it doesn't touch whereas you do that with a disc brake you know you finely tune it and then go down a hill through the nearest cold puddle you cool your brakes down so fast the fucking thing warps and it really pisses me off but anyway I've digressed. So this is the Fast Sports website. Now, Fast Sports operates two websites. There's fastsports.com. They've also got Wheels Far. And even to this day, I'm not sure why they do that. I suspect it's something to do with catering for the domestic market um, or not, but there you go. If I go back to the Fast Sports website, it, there's a few standout products that Fast Sports, Fast Sports make. The big one, is obviously the wheels, but their um, handlebars, the F1 cockpit is very, very good. I would say that is a world-class piece of equipment, that handlebar, really, really good. Um, if I click, you know, click on the wheels, they've got um, the C-Series and the Evo Series, I mentioned before, the Evo Series in rim brake is probably the best wheel that you're ever gonna get. I don't think you'd get any better than that um, and the Evo 6 is like a personal recommendation now buying from them I bought from them even before I became famous um, which was I don't know 10 maybe 12 years ago was it that long I can't remember oh sorry I'm only five but anyway yeah a while ago uh, and I've never had any problems with it and you look around the internet and people generally don't have that many problems with them um, which is which is no bad thing at all Shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. <laughs> right, specs of these wheels. Is that fucking pen working again? I just had a PowerPoint pen is working failure. Right, um... I think I've gone through this, but 30mm tube is compatible. I always put tubes in them. Um, just fucking around with sealant and it going off and oh, it's just a pain in the ass whereas just get a set of continentals don't go crazy with the uh the tire pressure being too low and then you won't really have too many issues um da -da 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 -da, yeah steel bearings steel spokes right this mm, fuck right oh fucking hell right so i should just mention what this is all about Contract testing is a bit different to the normal things that you get. So if you, I mean, it's basically like contracting is a job. Um, a lot of it is kept behind closed doors. Now, some companies make you sign NDAs. Now, I generally, 
I would say very rarely sign them um, and I usually just do it on goodwill now you might think well what was all that about if you take Pete Talk for example he'll always sign an NDA he's quite happy to do that I know he does that but I am a bit more old school I've always gone on the handshake and you've got um, you know there's quite a few people that I do business with where the strength of uh, you know an agreement is way more than signing an NDA so we just you know a handshake is the word um, so you know various companies do that but to go back to what, what I was actually on about a lot of this contract stuff it revolves around things where they can't do it in-house or they want a third party to do it so you know, some organizations let's say government organizations you can't do any work for them without an NDA so you know like the Shimano stuff the crank set failures there are a couple of NDAs in there that I guess protect me more than anybody else um, but you know I can say who I was doing work for so yeah the US government and uh, or the agency of the US government and the German um, uh, testing bureau which is tough uh, so that's that kind of analysis work that you get failure investigations and stuff like that aero work oh fuck's sake uh, and you'll quite i'll come on to that and then design for manufacture this is an interesting one because obviously i make bottom brackets and you know what well, criticism i get is they are overly you know preci precisely made and some people think that's a negative. Every time someone says that, I think, whoa, whoa, whoa look at that. I'm just the dog's knob. Um, but, you know, then it comes to the question of the price, because the price of them is more expensive than, for example, Rota or um, Hope or something like that. And the argument is, well, you don't need to make them to such precision tolerances. Well, the number of people that email me, email in, when they've got a fucked rotor or a, a hope bottom bracket and ask for advice, it will be you'll be amazed at. I've now put a point on my website where it says I will not take queries for third-party components because it just got so ridiculous. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not paid by fucking hope to do their technical support for them. Give them a fucking call. Um, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have put this in, but I did anyway. Bicycle engineers, if you look around on the internet, they basically wear hoodies. Now, in professional engineering circles, and I class myself as a, you know, a reasonably professional engineer, likes a bit of titty bars, betting shops, drinking, chain smoking. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm that kind of engineer. Um, you know, if, if I put my, you know, the, the tie on bit, we just laugh at them. I mean, I went to a conference, engineering conference, a turbo conference, right? That's turbo machinery, not fucking car turbo. And um, you know, the topic of conversation, obviously people see me on the internet. We just laugh at this lot because if they were any fucking good, they wouldn't be in it. They just would not be in the bicycle industry because look, it's fucking un not very well paid. Everyone's going pissing bust. And um, you get people like me who are going to give you a fucking rifting for being completely fucking stupid. But there you go. Um, and then bike reviewers, on the whole, they don't really review anything. They just like plant the bike, ride along for a bit and then say, oh, yeah, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Or in the case of Dave Arthur, it rides really well. It's, it's you know, it holds its speed well, blah, 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 blah. It's just a load of fucking bollocks. One thing they never mention is, depending on the size of the bike, it'll handle completely differently. The aerodynamics will be completely different. Uh, it, and it's just nothing more, really, than a paid advert. Um, so there you go. So in this context, Fast Sports sent the wheels in. They said, can you do this, this and this? And then they finally said, can you, you know, tell the world what you did and how our results came? Whether they would uh, want those results to come out if they were shite or not is, is for you to determine. 
Um, they weren't really shy. And to be honest, it's if you get to this level, <laughs> no one would no one would uh, send it to me if it was if it was on the the rifting end. In fact, there's only a cent that did it, um, and it was shite because it you know put me in a fucking ditch. Right, wheel build quality. I've fucking ranted along for there. There you go. Uh, yeah, fucking hell. Right, yeah, even tension. That tension is actually important. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, the rim manufacturer manufacturer. Um, there's some pictures on my website, so have a look on hambini.com. These are the bearing seats. So if you knock them out, um, then you know bike shops regularly knock them out, clean them, and put them back in. Um, if you're a bike shop, I really, I really would not recommend you did that because I've just recently had uh, a couple of uh, insurance queries where the bike shop's been rifted for doing it uh, and they've paid out. So if you're a bike shop, don't do it. If you're at home, do whatever the fuck you want. But uh, M7 is pretty much run of the mill. Uh, it's an interference fit with the tension on, so I've just put OK. Uh, some hubs I've seen, you know, you can get M5, which is uh, is you know really quite impressive for uh, for that kind of structure. But yeah, M7 is fine. There's no issues with that. Critical speed. So this is an area where Fastbox wanted it to be looked at. Critical speed is it's a bit more difficult to explain than lateral stiffness, but basically the wheels are flexible. And when you're riding along, when you get to a certain speed, the wheel flexes so much, it becomes out of balance by itself, if that makes sense. So let's say if I drew the shaft, let's say that's your axle. And you can't get anything perfectly balanced. So you have an out of balance, which in engineering speak, we just call M. And it's a distance from the center line of the axle. When you get to a certain speed, what happens is because of that, that out of balance force, the, the shaft or the axle flexes like that. And this distance here is called L. Yeah, and the wavelength, so this is M here. And the distance here, which is the wavelength, because it takes that profile. If it was to carry on, it would do that. So <clears throat> it's called the first mode, and that's called half L is the wavelength. For fuck's sake. Half L, or L over two is the label mm, Lambda equals half L. The second mode, which you don't really see unless the wheel is shit, is where the axle does that. So you've got an entire wavelength in the, the bending of the wheel. Now, the reason why wheels are actually very difficult to, to, to model um, you know, on pen and paper is because they're inherently flexible. So if you took something like a, a jet turbine rotor, it's, it's quite stiff, it's stacked together, but you'll still have this bending business going on. Um, now, if you took a Rolls-Royce uh, jet engine, some of the civil engines are triple spool, so that means there's three concentric shafts in there. So you've got one shaft there, that's a compressor and that's a turbine. You've got another one there, oh fuck's sake, like that. And then you've got finally the fan on the front end and the LP turbine, which I'm drawn really badly at the back. If you get this kind of bending in there, it's quite severe and some of the problems that uh, you have to overcome are you know, technically difficult. Now GE and Pratt & Whitney tend to have twin spool engines so they only have two concentric shafts. I say only, the bearing assembly is uh, you know quite you know difficult to do. Um, go, I don't know, I've gone out of uh, context here but the, basically what, what fast spots are looking at is to make sure the wheel handling is a lot better and that's what this critical speed business does this is the critical speed plot it's called a bode plot now uh, you'll see these black lines here and that's because it shows the speeds that i was running at and that's not data that they perhaps want you to see so 
along here, this is um, amplitude. So this is the amount of deflection that you get. And what we're having having here, let me just draw this on. So there's a common scale and that's just increasing speed. Now, normally you'd use RPM or CPM, which is cycles per minute. So what's happening here is we've got two things. We've got a phase angle and we've got an amplitude. Now the phase angle just means the, the onset of the, uh, the bend, let's say. So along here, the wheel is fairly constant. Get to here. What's happening is you can see the onset of the bend. So the, the, basically the, uh, the phase angle, which is the point in the rotation where the, the out of balance is experienced is starting to change. So it's going there and that corresponds with your peak here. Yeah, so that happens at a speed. It is the first critical speed. And then it comes down, but this phase angle stays constant. So that's, that's in the range, you'll have one critical speed and that's fairly common. This is the Ascent Polaris and this is a fairly, let's be nice about it, shite wheel. Now I is, they've sent it into you know, various places and I mean, in fairness, PT likes them. Um, but then Jeff at NorCal Cycling, I think he would paid a large sum to shill these wheels. These are shite, absolute shite. So if you look at this, <clears throat> this one only goes to a phase angle of like 180 degrees. Um, this has gone full scale back down the other end and back. So that, that, that is taking some serious movement. And if you look here, this corresponds to 18 dB of movement. Um, and then it comes back down here and then we've got a little bit of resonance here. So something else in the wheels vibrating and then you've got another thing here. Now, I think that is the second critical speed, but, um, you know, some of my colleagues didn't think it was, and there's a bit of a debate over whether that is a critical speed or not. Um, to be honest, we all think the wheels shit, but there you go. Uh, yeah, so that's the critical speed. So in, in this respect, this fast sports wheel is actually very good. So basically if you go and push it and go at fairly high speed, it, it won't be sort of speed wobbly erratic. Um, there's speed wobble, which is the ultimate, you know, pain in the ass, but there's also just general handling when you go around corners at high speed. And this one will, will objectively handle well. Um, it's, it's not a, you know, a subjective measurement. It's not my opinion. Um, I don't like, you know, opinions are just rather hard facts. This is the vibration plot. Uh, I didn't get as many miles on these wheels as I would have liked, but to be honest, it didn't really matter. Um, you've got wheel speed, fundamental train frequency. There's nothing really to report there. And uh, you wouldn't really expect it after 500 kilometers anyway. So there we go. Um, this is the imbalance, so I've put on a couple of other wheels there. So the wind space is here, the yellow line, and the uh, KPS front wheel is there. The fast sports is here. Historically, they have always been very low, so it indicates the manufacturing quality is pretty good. Um, so even this one, the S6, and it lines up well with the valve hole which also indicates that you've got like even uh, amount of material all the way around the wheel. So there's not, you know, like dense spots. This is the um, aerodynamic stability. So we've done mechanical stability and uh, put some other wheels on here. So this is on the left hand side It is well, it's Dmitriev number. So that's a, a colloquialism, but it's a uh, stability criterion normally around about one above that you'll be in a bit of bother I mean some people say 1.2 but what that means is as you pile on the turbulence and that's effectively what this is um, it's actually a function of all of these things so it's got Reynolds number, Nussle number, Prandtl number in there as well because um, if, you ch if you change the heat you can change the, the outcome of it it's not so prevalent in the um, you know, in land-based applications, but if you're up in the sky where the MiG-29 was, uh, it 
becomes more more important so over here and it's a log scale so when you start to um, increase the the amount of turbulence so over here you've basically got wind tunnel flow so it's all nicely parallel on this side you've got more like real life having a bit of a bad day um, and these these smaller things which are local vectors contribute to the total vector and that's what that number really represents so the more the higher the number the more screwed up the the, uh, the flow hitting the object is so um if you go above and it's greatly affected by the depth of the wheel which i'll cover in a minute but the the fastballs um wheel is this blue line which is this one so you, you can see over here i mean they're all stable even the very deep wheels but when you get to uh dmv of 10 this 80 mil wheel so a deep wheel is starting to um uh you know, become unstable so you generate a very high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other and then it bang collapses and then you've uh, you've got a problem so this is going unstable around about here so just after 10. whereas the uh <coughs> sorry the the fast sports wheel so the low uh, depth wheels they're you know that one there in particular the fast sports is going at 100. this one which is a 35 is that's a log scale so it's probably 200 something like that but there you go that's the uh, the choice you make right there is like and it probably wasn't so obvious earlier on in the video there is a, a big difference between this wheel and um quite a few of the other wheels <coughs> sorry this is your normal <coughs> aerofoil section um and you typically have if i forget the 105 percent rule which i think is bollocks historically these wheels have been rim brake bias so you've had this bit here which is where the brake track was and that's historically basically been flat so i've taken a wheel if this is the wheel i've taken a cut through there just bear that in mind because if i took a cut through here it would have a different profile um so that that's what that was so the rule of 105 kilos is oh fuck's sake is to make that a bit wider like that and that has a few features um and the basic thing that the proponents of this say is if the um air comes at a an angle of 12 and a half degrees it will stay attached there or thereabouts now the reality of it is well, I think it's bollocks. But um, if I forget my personal opinions to one side, the fast sports wheel is slightly different. So the normal, you know, optimum ratio is about one to four. So that kind of that kind of ratio. It's an arbitrary number. I mean, three would probably be okay. A thirty mil wheel, because it's thirty mil wide, you'd be looking at one hundred and twenty for the cross section. It's obviously nowhere near that. So what's happened? well a few things have happened the biggest one is we've moved to disc wheels so if that's the tire what the fast sports wheel does or attempts to do is that yeah so the tire becomes the thick bit of the aerofoil you'd normally call that the cord length but because um you, you know, obviously it's a, it's uh, not 120 mil long. They've gone and chopped it off there. So we've ended up with, oh, I can't really draw this well, like that. And what I'm trying to emphasize, but not very well, is the corners of the wheel rim are tapered. So on this, let me draw another one. I'll draw it a bit more exaggerated. So this, there's your tire. And then the wheel rim is tapered like that. Okay. And then 
and then that is exaggerated then they've cut it off here and that's because this angle here oops I'm drawing it wrong but it's, it's called alpha critical if you exceed that then um, air will come apart come uh, will uh, detach the you know the, the way these aerofoils work is you've got like that uh, air comes along like that and uh, let's say there's a bit of angle on it so let's just rub that out let's just go a bit like that this is exaggerated so air comes along there and then off the air moving here is at uh, higher higher speed when it's attached so it's got lower static pressure here you've got ram a ram pressure increase so the air comes along and then the aerofoil or the wheel rim is basically stopping the airflow so it takes all that energy out so you've got a high static pressure on that side so that has this tendency to push the wheel that way so you've got low pressure on one side high speed that high pressure on the other side it also means so this side is uh it's got what's known as a it's the diffusion side it's because we're going from a low pressure to free stream conditions which is higher pressure you also have got a natural tendency for air to um, go from a high state of pressure to a low state of pressure so the air on this side will try to get to there and that's how you end up with these swirls because the air is trying to constantly get round so it's just a mismatch of all these things that happen the uh, the fast sports wheel by you know chopping that off you will get a compromise because the straight line speed will be compromised because you've made it easier for the air to get over because you've created this huge bloody void there but the area of you know high static pressure is considerably lower than um than it would be if you had the whole thing so it makes the wheel more stable and that's why less deep uh, or shallower rims are more stable the other aerodynamic loss is if this is a um a very deep wheel where where spokes exist the airflow is literally uncontrolled because you've got this this huge void of nothing if this is the rim and it's nice and deep you're only having to deal with this very small area in the middle where it's unstable and that's where the aerodynamic loss is is in here um, but you know we'll come on to the problem of the disc in a minute um, this is the power comparison I mean I, I didn't really used to publish this because um, you've got a few issues here because wheels now the disc wheels have become so wide there's no real strict tire that you can use so there's a bit more of a mismatch the other i guess problem is some of these wheels are designed for gravel i've also got like road specific wheels in there like the wind space mega is road specific um, if you're wondering why this trifox wheel down here is quite fast it's basically because it's narrow um, if you make the wheel narrow and the corresponding tyre narrow, just by the, the laws of physics, you will make the tyre and the wheel fast because the drag is equal to CD times half rho V squared S. So by having a narrow uh, wheel, you make this S term, which is actually area, you make that small um and then you're not so reliant on cd so if you make the wheel wider you increase this s term so you'd have to make the cd term lower to get the same level of drag now in the, the wind space mega wheel review will be coming you'll understand why i've been publishing so much of late because when it comes you'll uh, you'll have a little understanding of that but um that that wheel is fast because you've got spokes or lack of them and they also the drag around the hub is also reduced um, the fast spots wheel is here so if you look there's sort of like a tapering diminishing returns that looks like that 
Because it's only 30 mil, it's actually a reasonable number. That's actually a very good number because you've got the Super Team Classics, which are 38 mil, um, and then the Elite 50s, um, which aren't that far ahead, and uh, 9 Velo 45s, uh, Windspace D67s, you see it's, it's tapering in uh, down there. This, uh, this is an interesting one because the disc, especially the Shimano disc, which I hate, I guess, but it was, you, look how much drag difference it makes. If you take the discs and the, um, the calipers off, it's like six watts at, uh, at 30 kilometers per hour. That's a lot. Um, and that's out of the wind tunnel, so it's in a controlled condition. The tire size on the uh, fast sports wheel is is not that critical. So this is probably with well, it is within the error margins of the of the test. So whether you go to twenty eight or thirty fours, it's within the error margin. But if you look here, the thirty two is wider than the wheel rim, and that obviously goes against the rule of one hundred five. Um because you've you've you're basically light bulbing the wheel but the way that wheel rim has been designed to take into account the taper you can see why that works if the uh if i was to draw it exaggerated but that's probably what the 34 would actually physically look like and the 28 is just a bit more of a sharper point now, if you're going to be totally anal about this, the the amount of wear that you get on okay, the wear on the front wheel or front tire is not that significant, but it will make a difference to your aerodynamics. You can you can see it; it's small within uh, you probably say it's within the aero range, but you, it's there. Um, aerodynamic summary: I mean, you can look at more of this on the website. Um, I mean, this this is a generally a fairly true statement. It is quite fast for a heavily spoke shallow wheel um people generally now i've noticed are moving towards shallow wheels because they're they're lighter weight um so they spin up faster because they've got less inertia um even elites some of the elite wheels um they they, they have got lightweight rims to you know aid that people in the comments debate that but there you go uh, the good, uh, let me can read that through all there. Um, it is a good choice for fast gravel. I think it would be very difficult for you to snap it. The bad, there's obviously always the badge snobbery, but I think this is starting to go now because you're starting to get more of this going mainstream and people don't have as much money as they once did. Spoke change could be quite tricky and competition is fierce. It is rabid at this price level. Questions, comments, uh, remember to like and subscribe. Follow me on Shitstagram, uh, website ambini.com. And uh, that is the end of this show. If you did enjoy it, remember to smash that like button. If you didn't, go screw yourself. And as always, keep banging your hairdresser.